focusing again to, on ch chapter 2 of the book of Philippians. Uh, as you remember way back in the eons of the early, early part of this month, uh, before the trip, we uh, went through the first uh, 18 verses and touched on three of our four points of this chapter uh, entitled to imitate our Savior. This whole chapter built on that theme as far as uh, what God has given me through this. We uh, went back and discovered that we are to, in order to do, to imitate our Savior, we must be like-minded that first week. Uh, that we must be Christ-minded. And we must be work-minded, we talked about two weeks ago, and then this morning, we're willing we will to, to uh, expand upon what it is to be ministry-minded. Uh, all of these first three prerequisites to what we're going to discuss today were necessary because they dealt with the inward part of us. The drawing together and being like-minded was not only inwardly, but it was corporately as, a, as from a church perspective. We must be like-minded. That's a prerequisite for us to become then Christ-minded, understanding who He is and putting on the mind of Christ as verses 5 through 11 have instructed us to do. We must be like-minded in desire of that. And so when we, we discovered that we were that at that point, then we could be Christ-minded and put on the mind of Christ. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, in verse 5. Then that set us up to be work-minded, to within ourselves, to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. So the people are see who we are, that we are who we say we are by how we live and how we share the gospel, how all of that matches up. All of that sets us up and, and gives us the prerequisites that are necessary to deal outwardly in ministry. We then become ministry-minded. And these last 12 verses will deal with that. And we uh, touch in on uh, really some incredible things that are said about two great men of the faith, Timothy and Epaphroditus. And we'll discover that as we get into this passage of Scripture this morning. So... With that all being said, let's turn to Philippians chapter 2, and we'll begin with verse 19 this morning. <clears throat> our desire then is that we be ministry-minded. I hope that is our desire, and if there's any doubt, if there's any little thing lacking in my life, in your life, uh, lives this morning, that when we're done with this uh, a little later on this morning, that we'll be more conscious of the ministry <clears throat> who we are here, not to compromise God's word. Okay, let's look begin with verse 19. But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy shortly unto you, that I also may be of good comfort when I know your state. For I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your state. For all seek their own, not the things which are Jesus Christ's. But ye know the proof of him, that as a son with a father, he hath served with me in the gospel. Him, therefore, I hope to send presently as soon as I shall see how it will go with me. But I trust in the Lord that I also myself shall come shortly. There are two sub-points under this fourth point we want to deal with today. Number one is support those in ministry who exalt Jesus Christ above themselves. It's very important as we become ministry-minded because of the work-mindedness that we discovered from the last time that we met two weeks ago. We are now ministry-minded, and in doing so, we must be seeking those and supporting those who uphold the truths of God's Word and who uphold the principles of God's Word. And thus, we don't just arbitrarily pick and choose out of the air who we're going to support. We never have done that here. We will not do that here at... at uh, New Testament Christian Fellowship, because it's important that we are ministry-minded and we are like-minded as we discovered earlier. So we're on the same page, basically. So number one, we are to support those in ministry who exalt Jesus Christ above themselves. Let's look at a man that's given here as an example. Young Timothy, who Paul the, uh, even uh, has said that he was like a son to I don't know if you remember what the description of given over in 1 Timothy. 
of this young man, a faithful man uh, who sat under the teachings of Paul. Can you imagine having that privilege to do that? <laughs> of course we are. We're under the teachings of Paul. He wrote these 13 books in the New Testament. So we're just that he's not, I'm a different Paul than he was. I don't claim to be anything like him. But uh, when it describes here in, uh, in Timothy, uh, I lost my place where that was exactly. But anyway, the description was that he sat under, he was brought up in the, uh, in the faith. He was brought up as a young man sitting under his mother and his grandmother, Lois and Eunice, and it's described there, he talked well. He was brought up in the Word. He was, he was a faithful young man. And now he's at a point where he is a, a, a young man in the faith and is serving and helping Paul, the apostle. And Paul gives us here four things about Timothy that I think are very important in these six verses uh, this morning, his first six verses. And that should help us as believers as we seek to support those in ministry who exalt Jesus Christ above themselves. Example, Timothy. Number one, in verse 19, Timothy was trustworthy. Look what it says here. But I trust in the Lord to send Timothy shortly unto you, that I also may be of good comfort when I know your state. So he trusted this young man. Timothy, uh, he said, Timothy, come see how things were in Philippi. If you remember, this uh, church in Philippi was a very poor church, as all the churches in Macedonia were. Though this is Philippi of Macedonia. They, they were very poor. And yet, these people participated in giving and helping the, church, the poor church in Jerusalem. These are one of the churches that it talks about in St. Corinthians. When Paul was, uh, was kind of getting after those in, in Corinth because they hadn't done it. They're the rich church. And they had said a year earlier they were going to give and help the churches in Macedonia. I helped the Jerusalem church, I'm sorry. Uh, and yet the people in Macedonia, the churches there, as poor as they were, stepped out and were willing to give and help the poor Christians in Jerusalem. In fact, if we turn back to 2 Corinthians chapter 8, we'll see exactly the description there given about this. The great passage of scripture in chapters 8 and 9 that we have talked through uh, many moons ago to deal with Christian giving and how we're to do that. But here's what happened. Back then, these, this church in Philippi participated in giving you know, to help those uh, poor Christians in Jerusalem. And it's described this way in the first two verses of chapter 8 of 2 Corinthians. Moreover, brethren, we do, wit, did we do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, of which Philippi was one of those. How that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberality. My, what a description given there that this church who didn't have a lot, they were poor, the people weren't wealthy like those in Corinth. And Paul takes, goes on to rebuke the folks there. He rebukes the people in Corinth because they didn't live up to what they said. The people in Macedonia did. The church of Philippi did. They supported. They were trustworthy. We, they supported here. What does it say here? The abundance of their joy and their liberality and, and their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberality. Oh my, their deep poverty it abounded because they gave joyfully to help those, those in, in Jerusalem. My, my, my. Well, anyway, getting back to that, this church was a, was a poor church, but yet Paul trusted Timothy by wanting to send him there. Of course, Paul could not come. If you remember, he was uh, in, I guess you would call it house arrest in Rome at the time that he wrote this uh, book, somewhere, I believe, around 60 AD, if I'm not mistaken there. Um, he'd already founded this church some 10 years earlier in Philippi, but uh, he was in house arrest, so he could not come. He trusted young Timothy. Well, we should support those who are trustworthy. You know, I think back in the ministries that we support here at New Testament Christian Fellowship, every one of them are trustworthy. Trustworthy to do what? They're trustworthy to share the gospel. Not trustworthy to, to uh, obtain for themselves and build up their own riches and make a name for themselves. No, every single one of those that we support are trustworthy to spread the gospel. Amen. 
use the funds that we send to share the gospel, wherever they are in the world. Praise God for that. Well, we should support them. The question is, are we all Could it be said the same for each one of us, myself included? I don't trust one person, just as Paul trusted Timothy to carry out the work. Are we trustworthy? Look at Matthew 16. See what Jesus has to say. Verse 24 of that great passage there, chapter 16 of Matthew. It says here. Then said Jesus unto his, his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, and take up his cross, and follow me. That's the question in this first part. Are we trustworthy enough to deny ourselves and take up our cross for him? Well, not only was Tim, Timothy trustworthy, he was uncompromising. Look at verses 20 and 21. For I have no man like-minded like -minded, who will naturally care for your state, for all seek their own, not the things which are Jesus Christ's. Uh, what a picture. It seems more and more and more and more difficult today to find those who will not compromise. And that spoke to me up there uh, in our, on our trip that we came from. Everywhere you turned, you didn't find compromise. Even when we saw the different programs and people came out, there was no hesitancy to speak clearly the gospel message. Mm -hmm. They weren't backing off and apologizing for offending anyone. Mm -hmm. Not one, I never saw it, I don't know if you did, but I never saw it anywhere. There was a non-compromising uh, uh, atmosphere there. And just as it was there, we are called to be uncompromising. We then should support those that are uncompromising. In every case, I have yet, and if they become compromising, we will not support them anymore. Our, our missionaries, none of them are compromising. Why do you think it's more and more difficult for those to not compromise today? I think the answer is so clear, verse 21. Isn't it? For they seek their own. Oh, fellow beloved Christian. We must not seek our own. And that's a hard thing to do. Not only in ministry, collectively and corporately, but it is an individual hard thing to do. Sometimes we want to seek our own, make a name for ourselves, make, uh, want people to pack a pat us on the back, say things, great things about us. Are we those, as described here, that seek our own? Or rather, are all of us uncompromising? Not only with each other, but with God's Word. Are we uncompromising? That's the question this morning. Paul writes to another church in Thessalonica in the second chapter of 1 Thessalonians. These words. In chapter 2 and verse 13. He writes these words, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. So when they received the word of God in Thessalonica, just as in these other places, they received it as truth, uncompromising. And we must do the same. Do we receive God's word in truth even when it steps on our toes, so to speak? Or do we fall back and be willing to back off and compromise? Oh, I pray we do not compromise. No matter what we do, anyway. We see what's happening, the threats over in Nepal that we talked about earlier with the law changes. Well, you can expect <coughs> laws can change here. More and more. We may be having a little respite right now with, uh, with the president that we have because he is he's not in favor of those things. But the time will come. <clears throat> My friends, do not mistake that because we are, we will pay for the sins that we have committed as a nation. And uh, 
so it will become increasingly difficult as the war tears for us to uh, speak uncompromisingly. The wrong word there. But are all of us uncompromising? Are we purposed to not compromise God's word? Oh, I trust them. Not only was Timothy trustworthy, he was uncompromising, but Timothy was faithful. Look at verse 22. But you know the proof of him, I like that statement, that as a son with the father, with the father, he has served me in the gospel. Timothy was a faithful young man. He was not a novice. He might have been young, but he was not a novice because it talks about here he was there was proof of him. And a person uh, ceases to be a novice when they have proved themselves worthy. We so much and so often today see uh, people put in leadership, men put in leadership within churches. They're not ready because they're novices. The Bible warns us against that. That's one of the, the qualifications in 2 Timothy about that. It's not to be a novice, someone that's not ready, that hasn't proved themselves faithful. Timothy was not that. He was a man of great character. In fact, Paul calls him my beloved son and faithful in the Lord. How would you like that said about yourself? That others look at you as a beloved son or daughter, faithful in the Lord. When I see my Savior. So at times I just it's disgusting the unfaithfulness. I'll give a toy to the one who died for me. But that doesn't mean I can't strive to be faithful for the remaining days I have to serve. And I hope that we won't give up and just say, well, I've been unfaithful, I'm just not going to try to be more done than you. Repent of it if you haven't done it. Determined to be faithful, just as this young man. Timothy wasn't perfect, but he was faithful. 1 Corinthians 4, 17, I believe is where that description is given of him. And Paul writes here to the church of Corinth. For this cause I have sent unto you Timothy, who is my beloved son and faithful in the Lord, who shall bring you into remembrance of my ways which be in Christ, as I teach everywhere. What about this morning? We are to support those who are faithful. And I believe we do. Never compromise that either. But are we faithful? Are we faithful? In fact, that same uh, passage of Scripture, verse 4 and verse 2, Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. It's required. If we're going to be a steward of God, a steward of the gospel, it's required that we be found faithful. It's not suggested. So, are we all faithful? Of course. Am I faithful? The challenge is that we be. <coughs> well, the fourth thing that Timothy was, he was, he was willing to serve. Look at verses 23 and 24. Him, therefore, I hope to send presently so soon as I shall see how it will go with me. But I trust in the Lord that I also myself shall come shortly. Timothy was willing to serve. What an example. Paul, was, as we said, was under house arrest. He was waiting, really, on his verdict to be given uh, before he sent Timothy, according to what it says here in verse 23. But Paul loved this church in Philippi. It was almost as if, if he had a favorite one, it's almost as if this church was his favorite one. He loved them dearly. He founded the church some 10 years before this uh, book was written. He loved this church greatly. In fact, you can see that in the very first chapter. When we went over that some weeks ago. See what Paul says about the church in Philippi in verse 3. I thank my God for every remembrance of you. Always in every prayer of mine, for you all making requests with joy, for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing, 
that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. So Paul had a real connection with this church, did he not? And Timothy was willing to serve and take care of things. Basically what Timothy was doing uh, was being really at, at Paul's beckoning call. Go wherever he went. We saw he was in Corinth <coughs> and other churches as well. Timothy was willing to serve. Well, we support those who are willing to serve Jesus Christ, don't we? We're willing to serve. Every one of our missionaries are willing to serve. The question is, are we willing to serve? And I am willing to serve. Whenever the opportunity comes. The great 100th Psalm tells us in the second verse. Serve the Lord with gladness. Is it a drudgery sometimes for us? Do we just kind of not look forward to it? I hope not. Oh, I've been involved in churches in the past where I had so many positions of leadership that yes, it was a drudgery. I'll admit to you today, I've never desired to go back to that. Because it wasn't. It became not serving the Lord. It became serving the church. There's a big difference. So God's not in that. So I, I, I praise Him today that we here want to serve the Lord. I believe that with every one of us. And we, we need to ask ourselves that question in the Are we willing to serve the Lord with gladness? Well, four great attributes of this great young man, Timothy. He was trustworthy, he was uncompromising, he was faithful, and he was willing to serve. Well, that's the first person we have given as an example in this passage of Scripture as we think of being ministry minded. The second point is support those in ministry as we look forward here are, who are not hesitant to put the needs of other believers ahead of themselves. The example here given is a man that's only mentioned a couple of times in Scripture. His name is, his name is Epaphroditus. Let's look at verses 25 through 30. Yet I supposed it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and companion in labor and fellow soldier, but your messenger and he that ministered to my wants. For he longed after you all and was full of heaviness because that ye heard that he had been sick. For indeed he was sick, nigh unto death, but God had mercy on him, and not on him only, but on me also, that I should have sorrow upon sorrow, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. I sent him therefore in the more carefully that when ye see him again, ye may rejoice that I may be the less sorrowful. Receive him therefore in the Lord with all gladness and hold such in reputation because for the work of Christ he was nigh unto death, not regarding his life to supply your lack of service toward me. Well, the example given here, he's only mentioned here in this passage and over in the fourth chapter of Philippians. But who was this? Epaphroditus. Big long word there. We don't hear too much about him, but what a faithful servant of God he was. What two, um, two wonderful examples that Paul uses in this passage. But, but Epaphroditus uh, looked up some information about what his job was, what he did, but his job <laughs> really was straightforward. It was to take the monetary gift to Paul that the Philippian church was giving, remember, in their deep poverty, yet they were giving. And they were sending that. He would bring it to Paul to help support his preaching of the gospel. Now, it goes on to say here, it wasn't an easy job and certainly carried with it a number of risks as he would be transporting this financial gift a great distance. This responsibility suggests Epaphroditus had a high level of integrity and respect from the brethren, and they knew he would take his job seriously. Back to 2 Corinthians 8, we refer to, talks about that more in detail. He completed this mission as Paul pointed out that he had received their gift and was amply supplied over the fourth chapter. We'll touch on that later. Uh, there are probably numerous lessons that we can just that we can consider just from the fact that he was chosen to do this work and he faithfully completed it. Boy, before we get into that, what about us? You think about that, this great example, these attributes that are given that Paul lists here. What about us? Are we faithful when God calls us to give us the work to do to not only do it, 
but to do it cheerfully and to complete it. Oh, my, we live in an age today where people want to call themselves in ministry and jump out there and do various things that they say God called them to do. And right in the middle of the task, they jump off and go somewhere else. They drop it. Oh, God's called me over here. Well, when really, in fact, money's calling me over here. It happens everywhere. Oh, more and more today. And the reason it is, is because it's become career-oriented people in ministry versus ministry-oriented people. And we're talking today about why we are to be ministry-minded. We cannot be ministry-minded if we are career-minded. That's not to say you don't you can't have a career. But I'm telling you, my friends, we cannot let career take the place of ministry. And it's happening everywhere in churches all over this world where people are seeing how they can take the stair step, jumping up from this church to that church to better themselves financially and get their names in light. Well, we are the antithesis of that, I hope, before God. We will never, I hope we will never, as long as we are in existence, seek that as this church. We don't care how many people are here. We want people to come who love the Lord, who are of like-mindedness, that put on the mind of Christ, that want to serve the Lord. It doesn't matter if it's just us and nobody else ever adds to this group in the future. It doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. We don't want career mindedness here. And we must guard <coughs> against that because it's everywhere. Paul gives us many examples or attributes, of, you might say, of this wonderful man in Paphroditus. Let's look at some of these this morning. I, I just marvel at so many things said about this man. I wish, I, I wish I could be like that. I wish I were like that. And maybe we challenge the same way. It's a challenge to me to want to be like that. But look what this Apostle Paul, one of the greatest men that's ever lived, the greatest missionary that God ever put on this earth, apart from Jesus Christ. Look what he has to say about this man, Epaphroditus, and how unassuming Epaphroditus is. He doesn't see anything. You can see it in how, he, how it's described here. Look what Paul says about him in verse 25. He gives us four or five things actually in this first verse. He calls him his brother. Well, in order to be a brother, you must know the one who gives that true brotherhood through Jesus Christ. You must know him. You must know him Truth, truthfully in the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his suffering, being made conformable unto his death. You must know he calls him his brother. But he doesn't just leave it there. Oh, I'm reminded when you say that word brother, Proverbs tells us, what about brother? There's one that sticketh closer. I can't get by that without expressing that. That Jesus Christ is the one that sticks closer. But it's important that he was considered a brother. He's also considered a companion in labor. It's a little closer. Companion in labor. And doing the same work, the Lord. Is that what we are? We're brothers and sisters in Christ. Are we companions in labor? But when I saw the participation in October past, yes, we were companions in labor. Sixteen people out there on that Friday night from our church. <coughs> well, fifteen of us, brother, uh, or fourteen of us, I think. Uh, uh, brother Brandon was with us and uh, Carter was with us. And then the next night, I believe we had about 10 of us all together that were there. Uh, just a wonderful time of being companions in labor, sharing the gospel. Not only does he call him a brother, a companion in labor, but he even goes further and says, what? He's a fellow soldier. What do you think of when a fellow soldier? It means he's on the offense. Takes me back in my memory to chapter 6 of Ephesians when we're given the armor of God that we're told to put on. Because we're told we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world and spiritual wickedness in high places. We're to put on the armor of God, the whole armor of God. We're commanded not to leave a piece off. And every piece is an offensive weapon. There's no guard or, or protection on the back 
because we're told to be a faithful soldier, a fellow soldier who marches forward and doesn't retreat in the work of the Lord. And that's what I see here when I think about young Tim, well, I mean young Epaphroditus. He is described as a fellow soldier who's faithful to march on. Are we fearful of the enemy? Do we turn our backs? I would imagine if we all are truthful, we have turned our backs. I have. I don't want to be challenged not to turn my back. I want to be a soldier that presses on. I can't press on as fast as some of the younger guys can anymore, but I can still press on. I need to press on. We all must be fellow soldiers. Epaphroditus was that fellow soldier. But he just wasn't a fellow soldier marching forward in a conquest. He had the conquest. He had the truth. What does it say here? That he was also, in verse 25, a messenger. A messenger does what? Brings a message. Brings truth. Let me see that word. Uh, messenger. Witness. A messenger, I believe, is used in Revelation. Messengers. Oh, what a description. This man was so faithful. He was such an incredible um, man of God. <coughs> a brother, a companion in labor, a fellow soldier, a messenger with the truth, that message. Well, the truth was his message, right? But he also was a servant. Look what he says here. He had everything to march on. But what it told me. From where Epaphroditus was concerned, it never was about him. What does it say at the end of verse 25? And he that ministered to my wants or my needs, is what they say in there about that Paul wanted a new car or whatever. No, it's his wants, his needs that he had to have there. He ministered to him, made sure that the apostle Paul was taken care of in every way he could. Well, what about us? Yes, we're brothers in Christ. Brothers and sisters in Christ. We're, we've, we're companions in labor. We're the fellow soldiers. We're marching forward with the truth. We're messengers of the truth. Do not compromise that truth. And while at the same time, are we willing to serve? That seems in the world's way of putting things, those two things seem contradictory. We march on in, in, in full uh, authority of God's word, but yet at the same time we're going to be a servant to those around us, our believers, fellow believers. <coughs> well, Epaphroditus wasn't just those few things. <coughs> Look what it says in verses 26 and 27. It really struck me. For he longed after you all and was full of heaviness because that he heard that he had been sick. Let's pause there for a minute. That is, seems like an odd statement, doesn't it? He was troubled that they had heard he was sick. Now, he was so desirous to not focus on himself that he didn't want people worried about him. He was, I mean, as it said, here he was sick nigh unto death. He was really sick. But yet he didn't want to distract them by making them be aware of what was going on with him physically. I just was strong, struck by that. He longed before you all with, and was full of heaviness because they heard him sick. <coughs> I mean, it must want everybody to know. There's nothing wrong with with people being aware if a person has a problem, just so that we can pray for them. Sometimes maybe we don't want to exaggerate that once in a while and make it more than it is. We can, we can do that and just call attention to ourselves. I've seen it happen before. And I've probably been guilty of that myself. But Epaphroditus wasn't. He was <coughs> like that. He just kind of pushed that aside. He didn't want to emphasize that. He didn't want to distract that. Distract these folks with that. He longed after them with a full, with being full of heaviness. That means he just weighted down with it. Very troubling to him that they had to be distracted, knowing that he was sick, dying to death. My, what a man of 
what a testimony that man had. That tells me this man was sacrificial. What does verse 27 say about the sickness? He would indeed was sick nigh unto death. But God had mercy on him. <coughs> and that'll put him on the But on me also. Paul said he would have described this if God had taken him as sorrow upon sorrow. That's what a dear man of God, Epaphroditus, was, and who he was to the apostle Paul. He was sacrificial. We sacrificial. You know, there, there's a difference between um, a, a token giving <clears throat> and sacrificial giving. There's a big difference in that. Because sacrificial giving means we give in faith, believing. You know, we don't give uh, with the abundance we don't have. I mean, Second Corinthians 8 talks about that. You don't go out there and make pledges with something you haven't heard. We never want to do that. Don't pledge anything. We'll never ask you to do that here in this church. But others do. They want people to commit monies that they haven't even earned yet. And so I, we shouldn't do that. All, God's Word doesn't teach that. We're to give out of the abundance of the things we have. But we are to be faithful in what we do give. And all my friends, <clears throat> sometimes it can be sacrificial. But we're to be obedient. matter? Well, I didn't, maybe I shouldn't even ask that question that way. <coughs> Would it be that if any one of us, we've had some in here that were sick, very sick, but are we, even through those times when maybe we've been very sick, are we more conscious of ourselves and what we're going through? Be conscious as Epaphroditus was, ministering to others. I thought about Brother Mike. Brother Mike Baum, pastor over at uh, Living Word. If you remember, a little over a year ago, several of us went down and preached in his stead when he had gone through his heart problems and his leg amputation. But I went up there, visited him in the hospital, as many of you all others did that went down there. It was just such an incredible thing to me. The, the emphasis reminded me of this passage of scripture because it was never about him lying there in bed, his, his leg having been cut off, had that multiple bypass uh, operation for his heart and praise God it happened when he was at the hospital and when he had a heart attack, but it was never at any time you talking with him did you find that true, the rest of you that saw him, it was talking about praising the Lord, witnessing to people about others, it never was about what he was going through it really struck me, what a man of God that would fly there who had all the reasons to complain, but he wouldn't do it. And it really hit me between the eyes. Why should I ever complain? I've got two legs. I can walk. From the time he tried to encourage us. Yes. That's why he that's why he was all about encouraging when Laura did went down. He just kept on encouraging us. He did. He did. And that, I mean he had it. He was sick nine to death when he had that heart attack. If he hadn't been in the hospital, he probably would have died. But praise God, he was there. It wasn't his time to go. And I thought about him. What another example of a man who put his emphasis on ministering to others and over himself, no matter how badly he was going through something. Epaphroditus was that one. He was sick nine to death, yet he was sacrificial. What about us? Are we willing to be sacrificial for the sake of the Lord? Well, he didn't quit, did he? Epaphroditus goes on further to tell us he was available for service. Even though he went through a period of being sick, nigh to death, he didn't quit. He didn't say, I'm done, I'm retired, I'm old enough now, let somebody else carry, carry the, the torch, so to speak. No. What does it say in verse 28? I sent him, therefore, the more carefully that when you see him again, you may rejoice and that, I, uh, and that I may be less sorrowful. Epaphroditus was available. No complaints at all. He's come through this terrible sickness. Yeah, I'm ready to go. Lord, wherever you want me to go. And through the Apostle Paul, the excitement was there was to send him to see how things were going there. So I, I sent him there for more carefully. Are you available for service? Am I available for service? 
whenever the Lord calls. Oh, it may not be convenient. I may not feel well at a particular time. And I believe we can find an excuse every time the opportunity comes, can't we? If we really want to. But praise God for that, uh, for the service. And I praise God for some of the young uh, people that just willingly go out there without any hesitation and go out in these malls and different places and share the gospel. That's such an encouragement you know, to us to see that. And the opportunities that we have when we get together to minister the gospel. Wherever we go, what a great opportunity. What an incredible thing that is. Are we available for service? Am I ready to <coughs> serve the Lord when the opportunity comes? Are you ready? Well, I trust that we'll be like a pack of knives. No matter what happens, we're always available. Oh, what a great man of God. Well, all of these things may be true, but what happens if a person is not above reproach? Oh my, we've seen a lot of that in ministry, so-called ministry. People are not above reproach. You know, First Thessalonians tells us that we are to abstain from not all kinds of evil, as some of these translations change it to. We are to, to, to abstain from all appearance of evil. Chapter 5, the fifth chapter of, of, of First Thessalonians. We are to abstain from all appearance of evil. We are to be above reproach. Whereas legally, maybe we could be right here and just barely get by. How many times do we want to know how close can we get to the line of crossing the line in the sin to do something? Oh my. Paradise wasn't that way. We're called to be above, way up here, above reproach, fellow believers. We are not even to get close to that line of sin. And that's what I like what it has to say here. Receive him therefore in the Lord with all gladness. Hold such in rare in high esteem or reputation. Can that be said of you? Can that be said of me? That we are above reproach? I have to say it. At times that I'm not. Oh, I can be slapped upside the face by the, by the Holy Spirit and conviction too. Doesn't take long. My desire, and I hope your desire, our desire, should it be? Yes, it should be. I hope it is, as we're challenged today by these examples that are given to us that we want to be like the Paphroditus, be above reproach. Don't even get to the reproach line. Stay well above. And then, verse 30. Paphroditus was dependent. Mm. What another great word there is that we as Christians should adhere to. Are we dependable? Can we be counted on? Is our word our bond? Does it mean something? <clears throat> well, I've been around a lot of people. They'll say one thing with their, with their mouth and profess to be a Christian and when they carry it out, it's totally opposite. I've experienced that in, in the business world before. People that call themselves Christian, the word did not match up with their deeds. It's a challenge to me. Am I dependable? Can my deeds always match up? Will they always match up with my word? Will that happen for you? Is that true in our lives? Oh, my friends, we should be like this man Epaphroditus. It says, because for the work of Christ, he was nigh unto death, not regarding his life to supply your lack of service. I meditate on these words and just wonder, can that be said about me? I have to say, sadly, I am not like that all the time. I want to be like that. Read that again. Because for the work, that's the work of the gospel, the work of Christ, he was nigh unto death. He pushed himself to do the work of the Lord and became sick, nigh unto death. <clears throat> Not even regarding his life to carry out the ministry, to supply your life of service. That doesn't mean that the Philippian church was not doing their job and they failed back some funds. No, that was because they were sending all they could have, which was not enough to supply for Paul. They were giving all they could out of their uh, heart of generosity and out of their poverty. 
But yeah, he he worked to help supply the difference. Where are the men of impeccable character today? Men are not only brothers, and men, men and women as well, that are not only brothers and sisters in Christ, that are not only companions in labor, that are not only fellow soldiers of the gospel, that are not only messengers of truth, that are not only servants, that are not only sacrificial, that are not only available for service, that are not only above reproach, and that are not only dependent. But all of these, everyone, not just one. Where are those people today? In chapter 4, Paul sums it up. And I don't want to take from whenever that chapter is taught here in the future. I do want to point out this point. Because Paul sums up what he has said here about Epaphroditus in verse 18. He says, But I have all and about. I am full, having received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you, an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. Is that description of your and my work for the Lord. That order might stink from time to time before the Holy Righteous God. Mm -hmm. I know I have sent up a stinky order. I don't want to do like that anymore. What about you this morning, too? How's the description of your service for the Lord? Can it be described as an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well pleasing to God? Convicted me. I want that to be my life. And I know, I believe you all want that the same for your lives. How many of us are easily discouraged? And ready to quit? Yes, you ever been discouraged after a mission field? Haven't we all been discouraged by having people slam the door in our face? Tell us no. Well, I ran across and I thought about a song that uh, I don't know if I can read it. I'll try to. Lyrics of this song, Press On, spoke to my heart. <coughs> oh, you, oh, you may have heard it. It's good by Selah. Group, very beautiful song. <clears throat> the lyrics are so good. It says the following, When the valley is deep, when the mountain is steep, when the body is weary, when we stumble and fall, when the choices are hard, when we're battered and scarred, when we've spent our resources, when we've given our all, in Jesus' name, <laughs> we press on. In Jesus' name, we press on. Dear Lord, with the prize clear before our eyes, we find the strength to press on. In Jesus' name, my brothers and sisters, we press on. In Jesus' name, we press on. Dear Lord, with the prize clear before our eyes, we find the strength to press on. We find the strength to press on. To press on. Will we be like Timothy and Epaphroditus and be ministry minded they pressed on until the end? Are we willing to be faithful to the end? No matter what comes our way? If so, let us be like minded. Let us be Christ minded. Let us be work-minded. And let us be ministry-minded. Hebrews 10, in closing, gives us these words of encouragement. Beginning with verse 22. Let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. 
Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for He is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the matter of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more, as you see the day approaching. Matthew played that song this morning. I couldn't help but well up inside. <clears throat> because our Lord is the reason that we are any of these things that we've talked about, of being like-minded, Christ-minded, work-minded, and ministry-minded, as this chapter is brought out. <clears throat> but I love the words of that old hymn that he sang, written way back when, about 150 years ago. Crown him with many crowns. The Lamb upon His throne. Hark! How the heavenly anthem drowns all music but His own. Await my soul and sing of Him who died for thee and hail Him as thy matchless King throughout eternity, through all eternity. Crown Him the Lord of life who triumphed o'er the grave and rose victorious in the strife for those He came to save. His glories now we sing, who died and rose on high, who died eternal life to bring, and lives that death may die. Crown Him the Lord of love, behold His hands inside, those wounds yet visible above, in beauty glorified. All hail, Redeemer, hail, for Thou hast died for me. Thy praise and glory shall not fail throughout eternity. Dear beloved, beloved brothers and sisters, great description of who we are serving as we are seeking to be those things that this chapter has brought out to us. And we can only accomplish this if we follow what it says in verse 5. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. Oh, I hope you've been challenged from God's Word today. It hit me squarely. I want to be white minded, Christ minded, work minded, and ministry minded. I will be I be willing to put that mind in Christ. Let that be put on in my life. May it be Praise His holy name. We adore Him. His praise and glory shall not fail throughout eternity. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we come before You today. Glory is the greed. Be challenged by it. <clears throat> the truth that shall never fail. It has not failed. <clears throat> Though we as men try to change it. Satan did that back in the Garden of Eden, changed the truth of God into a lie. And we continue to see that happen today. But, oh God, we thank you that your truth will prevail and is prevailing even now against those uh, wicked uh, lies that are being uh, portrayed everywhere. And we thank you that your truth will remain, remain through all eternity. Thank you for the reminders from your word this morning. Oh God, we pray that you challenge our hearts as we go through this. May we not be satisfied with anything less than to be faithful to you until the end. Thank you for your work. Thank you for showing us that today. And for the great examples in the Apostle Paul and young Timothy and in the wonderful servant of Pathodias that have given us great examples of you living in their lives and them doing ministry and carrying out your work so that we can have those patterns there. More importantly, Thank you for our Lord Jesus Christ, who set the greatest example for us, who had, who is true, who will never die. May we put, be resolved to let this mind be in us, to us also in Christ Jesus. Thank you again for this truth of your word. Now, bless the food that we're about to partake of. Grant us physical strength from it. May we go from here, <clears throat> determined, Lord Jesus, to uh, continue to be faithful. Sound the loud sound of the trumpet take place. We meet you in the air.
and so shall we ever be. In his precious holy name. Thank <laughs> you.